Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Speaking of Wealth Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we discuss profit strategies for speakers, publishers, authors, consultants, coaches, info marketers, and just go over a whole bunch of exciting things that you can use to increase your business, to make your business more successful and more and more passive and more and more automated and more and more scalable. So we will be back with a great interview. Be sure to visit us at speakingofwealth.com. You can take advantage of our blog, subscribe to the RSS feed, and many other resources for free at speakingofwealth.com. And we will be back with a great interview for you in less than 60 seconds. You know, sometimes I think of Jason Hartman as a walking encyclopedia on the subject of creating wealth. Well, you're probably not far off from the truth, Penny, because Jason actually has a three-book set on creating wealth that comes with 60 digital download audios. Yes, Jason has that unique ability to make you understand investing the way it should be. It's a world where anything less than 26% annual return is disappointing. I love how he actually shows us how we can be excited about these scary times and exploit the incredible opportunities this present economy has afforded us. We can pick local markets untouched by the economic downturn, exploit packaged commodities investing, and achieve exceptional returns safely and securely. I also like how he teaches you to protect the equity in your home before it disappears and how to outsource your debt obligations to the government. And the entire set of advanced strategies for wealth creation is being offered at a savings of $94. That's right. And to get your Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series, complete with over 60 hours of audio and three books, just go to jasonhartman.com forward slash store. If you want to be able to sit back and collect checks every month, just like a banker, Jason's Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series is for you. My pleasure to welcome Sean Andrich to the show. He is a podcaster who has been podcasting for a long time. He heads up a website called gamerswithjobs.com, not without jobs, with jobs. And he's coming to us today from the great white north up in Canada. Sean, how are you? Welcome. I'm doing very good. Thank you. I'm uh, very glad to be here. And believe it or not, some of our trees are actually turning green. So we're, we're in good shape. Fantastic. Now, where exactly are you located? Uh, I'm right in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So I'm I'm in central Canada, about two hours from the border. If I drive straight down, I'll hit places like Minneapolis. It takes about seven hours from here. Fantastic. Well, well, welcome. And one of the things you said to me before we started the show is you said that you've been podcasting since before the iTunes era. Wow, <laughs> that's a long time. <laughs> uh, did, did, were you podcasting with an RSS feed back then? Uh, no. At that point, basically all you were doing was you're using FTP, you're uploading an MP3 file, and you're providing a link on your website to download it directly. And there was no no RSS feeds, no subscribing. Uh, it was very a very manual thing, and a majority of people would just listen to it sitting at their computer. What year was that? Uh, oh gosh, that would have been uh, in the early 2000s, anyway. Fantastic. Wow. That's like prehistoric days in the world. Of oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Long fantastic. Time. Well, so, so what is Gamers with Jobs? Well, Gamers with Jobs is a website I started uh, with a friend of mine uh, about nine years ago. And, and we basically, as we were getting older at that point, we were both in our 20s. We started to feel like all these gaming communities around video games and around nerd culture were very immature. Uh, they were very unpleasant, and we didn't really enjoy being in them. So we decided to make a site that was geared more towards people like us. We had jobs, you know, families, mortgages, all this other stuff. We wanted to create uh, a site that could host the content that at the time we were writing and also just a community uh, that was very uh, nurturing and supportive of our kind of lifestyle, which is just 
yes, I'm an adult. Yes, I have a lot of responsibilities. You know, in my case, I, I run a pretty large company and everything else. But I still really like video games. It's I've been playing video games as long as I've been watching movies or TV or reading books. So it was, it was a really important hobby for us. Uh, so we wanted to create a place that was kind of safe, a safe, fun place to talk about that and uh, to uh, support other people talking about it too. And, and just so people have a point of perspective, you mentioned to me before that you've been playing video games since you were about four years old and you're about 31 now. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So you've got the real responsibilities of real life. You're not eating pizza in mom's basement playing video <laughs> games all day, right? Yeah, no, that's an old kind of stereotype. The, the gaming industry, believe it or not, a majority of the sales uh, come from people who are in their 30s uh, because the, those are the people who've grown up playing them. They're also the people who have the depo- disposable income. So it's actually a really large part of the market at this point. Well, let's talk about your actual show. How many episodes do you have so far? Uh, the current iteration of it, the Gamers with Jobs conference call, uh, which you can find on iTunes, that one, uh, we're just up, I believe we're at episode 290. Uh, we're just rounding on that right now. So we're getting close to 300. And uh, prior to that, we had a, sh- a show called GWJ Radio that was myself and another one of the writers from the site. Uh, that ran about 20, 30 episodes, and I've dabbled in other people's shows and projects in the past as well. And tell us a little bit about your format, audio, video, multiple people, just you talking. Uh, it's it's primarily an audio uh, format, so it's usually myself and three, sometimes four others. If you go above five, it, it's too many people, uh, too much stepping on each other's toes, and you, no one can have a chance to really have a unique voice and perspective because you're trying to let everybody have their say. So we, we usually keep it around four. We don't really delve into like the news of the day. Uh, we basically usually start the show the first 20 minutes, very conversational. We talk about the games we're playing. We talk about uh, what we're interested in uh, as far as that stuff goes, what our experiences are. Uh, and then in the middle of the show, we'll usually do a block on a specific topic, you know, maybe about the industry or about game design or about, you know, like uh, Julian Murdoch on our show. He talks quite a bit about his kids. You know, his kids are 8 to 12 years old and he talks about playing games with them. Or So we hit a lot of different topics. And then the back end of the show is for emails, re- responding to what people send in over Twitter and by email and things like that. That that's interesting to have four people on a show. That's a lot of people. You're not all in the same location, right? So how do you what technology are you using? Just Skype or uh, something uh, else? We used to use Skype. Skype was our go to for a long time, and I don't know if it was just coincidence, but when Microsoft yeah, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> somehow it just started getting really flaky, and I, it doesn't make sense. But there it is. So over time, what we've ended up doing, we'd actually tried a whole bunch of different video calling systems uh, because we found that the first hundred or so episodes we were actually just audio only and you can imagine we've got four or five people in audio only form it's an editing nightmare there's a lot of times where two people are talking at once and you know you're trying to decide who's going to shut up to let the other person have their say so we started using video so we could kind of signal when we wanted to say something so the conversation can flow uh, much easier at this point our show is almost edit free uh, aside from edited in music breaks and things like that but what we've been using lately has been uh, Google Plus uh, Google Plus has built in video and audio chat And you can see everybody at once. It'll just, whoever's speaking is the one who's kind of the bigger picture on the video screen and everybody else is along the bottom. It condenses very well. It'll automatically degrade the video quality if the connection kind of needs more juice for audio. So it runs really nicely. We've had no crashes or glitches with it. Uh, It's very straightforward to use and it's worked great for us. Uh, At this point, we're actually able to take that and through Google Plus broadcast the show that we're recording live to YouTube so people can actually listen in on us recording the show a few days before it actually goes online in its edited version. Well, I mean, Google Plus is a social networking site, though, you know, right? I mean, yeah, what, 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 you're using it as your Skype system? I kind Basically, of don't understand that. Yeah. Google Plus has uh, something built into it called Hangouts. That's the Hangout feature, right? That's okay, the Hangout yeah. feature. Okay. So you start a Hangout, you can invite specific people in, and then uh, and that's that's all. That's video and audio. That's everything. So that's one aspect of it is that's what we'll actually use so we can see each other, we can talk. That's our audio. So, But what we also do, and this is something that podcasts have started to pick up on over the years. It used to be you just record your Skype feed. You edit it and you upload it to the internet. What we do now is that with our, everybody records locally their own track. 
So even now as I'm talking to you, I'm actually recording my local track. So there's none of the bleeps and bloops or cutouts or lag that comes with the, the audio feed. This is a direct track right to my hard drive. I take that file, I export it as an MP3, and I upload it to a server. And then our production guy, Jonathan Downen, uh, he works on the site called techthingdaily.com. Uh, and he takes the, all, all of our four audio tracks and he actually splices, he puts them all together. So basically, and he, and he uses the master track like from the Google Plus Hangout uh, just to sync up everybody's audio. And once that's done, what you're listening to is actually everybody's local direct track. So it's the absolute best audio quality you can have you know, even though I'm in Canada, a bunch of the people I do the show with are in the States and various places, uh, it works very, very well. It's as close as you can get to being in the same room without actually physically being there. Well, as the old saying goes, it's the next best thing to being there, right? <laughs> yeah. So when you're using Google Hangouts, though, if someone doesn't want to do that because it sounds a little complicated to splice everything together, do you have a recording system you recommend? A lot of people with Skype just use Call Recorder uh, or one of those. That's what I use. Yeah. Uh, the one I like is uh, with Skype, I like to use an MP3 Skype recorder. Uh, it is incredibly straightforward to use. And one thing that it does that I really like is it'll actually record a stereo track. So it'll actually on one channel have my audio and on the other channel have everybody else's. Yeah, so Call Recorder if, does that too. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So I find those are pretty straightforward and pretty nice to use. In, in a, if I need to use Skype, then I'll use Skype Recorder and it, it works very well, outputs it as an MP3. It's, it's very clean. What about Google Hangouts though? What do you record with there? Oh, uh, with Google Hangouts, we kind of cheat a little bit. Uh, we'll actually uh, have a, an additional computer that's in the Hangout that's not actually a person. It's just a computer and it just records the whole, it just records whatever's coming in basically. So yeah, stuff like that. Uh, Google Hangout, if you Google, oddly enough, uh, Google Hangout recording, uh, there is actually a ton of free and paid software packages out there that are made specifically for recording those Hangouts. Just, uh, so yeah, similar to Call Recorder and stuff. Yeah, ex right. Same idea, yeah, but it'll also record the video if you want, which is kind of nice. What you didn't mention that I thought you were kind of alluding toward, you sort of mentioned part of it, is that is that what you do, it's interesting, you hang out in Google Hangouts and you see everybody, each other on video. However, you really don't use that video show except, you know, I know you upload that or people can see it live. I guess they can watch the Hangout, right? They can watch the Hangout, yeah. Or they can, and it's stored in YouTube after the fact. Right, but what's interesting is, so it'll stream live to YouTube, but really the reason you use that is just truly to make a better audio. Is that correct? Exactly. This is an audio show, absolutely. So so in other words, the reason you're using video because you're you're not in the same location and it allows you to have four people without stepping on each other so you can sort of motion to each other as you would in the room like your eyes might perk up hey i want to say something oh or, yeah you know, like you it, raise your hand it's, right it's, it's yeah it's as if you're actually in school if you have something you want to say while someone else is talking you actually just raise your hand to the camera so everybody can look and say oh, okay he has something to say they can back off and then you can step in once the other person's done having their saying their piece basically i'm sure your listeners really appreciate that because a lot of these shows you know with people talking over each other it's just really annoying i mean it's amazing that you see that too on broadcast television like you'll be watching a news channel and they're all talking over each other it's really annoying what's what is the growth of your show been like so this one the gamers with jobs how old is that again? Uh, the Gamers with Jobs conference call, the show itself is about five years old, I think, give or take. So in uh, five years, point. yeah. Five, yeah, years, five years, about 290 episodes. What kind of growth have you seen? G give us kind of a perspective as to when it started, what kind of numbers in terms of downloads and subscribers, and then what do you have now? Yeah, sure. Asking a, geez, you know, asking a podcaster what his downloads are, it's almost like asking somebody what they make in their job, you know, it's right. kind of a... Well, if you it, don't want to share a, it, don't. No, no I don't, don't mind understand. at all. It's just, it's kind of funny because it's, it's something that I'll meet fellow podcasters in person at conventions and things like that. And it's always something people kind of dance around. No one wants to talk about it. It's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, when we started, uh, it was very uh, humble. You know, we, we already had a website that had been running for a few years, but, uh, you know, people just, they weren't sure if they wanted to hear us speak or anything else. So we were doing maybe two to 400 downloads per show in the early onset. And you kind of need to be mentally prepared uh, to start very small and, and humble like that. Uh, over the years, uh, we've always grown the show with doing interviews, doing interviews with various industry people, the people who have a presence on Twitter and social networks and things like that. So we've always gotten a boost every new person we'd interview bring in because they'd bring new listeners in. And 
hopefully the show's good enough they want to stick around. So over the years, it's it's grown very steadily in a very kind of organic way for the most part. These days, we're up to around 30,000 downloads per show, give or take. Uh, so that that's kind of where we set a little spike if we have an interview, and it'll go up and down a little bit. But it's pretty rock solid at that point because most people subscribe. Whether they actually listen to it versus their iTunes just keeps downloading the new one. I don't know. <laughs> right. No, but nobody really knows. But then again, you know, when magazines and newspapers and, and television stations and radio, when they publish their ratings, nobody knows either. I mean, that's like saying you, you, you put an ad in Time magazine and they say a million people will see the ad. Well, not if they don't turn to that page. Yeah, and, and, with, and with podcasting, I can drill down very deep. I can tell you exactly how many listeners we have in Frankfurt, Germany. Right. Like, you know, because uh, with just thanks to analytics and metrics and tracking and all that, you can you can really just boil it down to really fine, fine details. So it's it's pretty great for that. You sure can. You sure can. Well, now, are, are you doing advertising on your show yet or any monetization strategies? Uh, we do. Uh, and, and it's still it's sporadic. I would say there was a time a few years ago and we experimented with just basically letting uh, community members sponsor the show say if they had a business or an online business or anything like that, they could sponsor it and we would do it that way. Uh, and we just charged like 50 bucks. It was really more just a nominal fee, just to, you know, it was nice to get a little bit of money so we could get better mics, things like that. Uh, these days, uh, if we've done sponsorships, it's usually been for companies like Audible. Audible reaches out. We seem to be doing a couple a month at this point. Uh, and uh, so that's just a pre-roll. A quick, you know, it's brought to you by audiblepodcast.com slash GWJ. And then in the middle of the show, uh, we'll recommend a book for someone to download and, and go from there. So we've done Audible. We've done a few game sites. But we're, we're very picky about what we're willing to do. And frankly, uh, there's not a ton of companies out there looking for podcasts to sponsor yet. It's, I've talked to some advertisers as to why. And, I mean, there's some pretty interesting reasons um, yeah, GoToMeeting is interested. Audible seems very big in it. I think they're missing a golden opportunity, frankly, because oh, yeah. uh, podcasters have such loyal audiences, and most podcasters are just really advertising their own businesses on their shows. But tell me those interesting reasons that you say that maybe corporate America is missing the boat. Oddly enough, uh, one of the reasons uh, that uh, I've talked to advertisers why they don't like advertising in podcasts is because they can't guarantee in a measurable way whether or not somebody listened to the ad right whether or not somebody even listened to the show like i said if, if somebody's if if somebody's computer is downloading the show every week i can't guarantee that they're actually listening to it and if they are i can't guarantee they're not skipping through any ads that may show up yeah you can't kind of you can't that's so that's so ridiculous because you yeah. can't guarantee that on any other medium either exactly you, know, you play a commercial on television how do you know the person didn't walk away and go to the restroom that's that's Right. Ridiculous. Just, uh, it, the idea with TV is that they're casting such a wide net, it doesn't matter, right? And, and with podcasting, podcasts are very specific. And I've also been told, oddly enough, that podcast, the podcast audience is considered to be fairly savvy. So that, that means they tend to be a little bit more resistant to a lot of advertising that you might see on TV. A lot of stuff that's like Coca-Cola or Pepsi or, you know, the big major companies that do big major ad campaigns. I think that podcast audiences are they're perceived to be more technically minded and uh, less likely to just sort of mindlessly buy into that. So I, I think the most success is had when you're, in our case, like Audible, like I love audiobooks. I, I download audiobooks all the time. So I'm, I'm happy to be a sponsor for them. And it gives me a chance to tell people about something from there, like a book that I like. So I get an I get I get some personal benefit on that, you know. So so we've done that before, and and that's been really fun. I just don't think that it's it's considered to be a very sexy platform yet uh, for for some of those reasons I mentioned. I think at the end of the day, if you're if you're an advertising person, if you need to sell a product, what your client wants to know is how many people did you reach with my ads, right? Because they it's very difficult. Like even my own business, it's very difficult to measure the impact an ad can have on your business, right? Unless you ask really specific questions uh, to people. And so uh, I, think that, I think that when it comes to podcasting, they just can't make the numbers dance in a way that sounds impressive. So I, I think that's, a main, that, that's kind of the main sticking point right sure, now. Sure, sure. And you take donations for your shows as well, right? We do. What we, do, what we don't do and what we decided very early on, and the site's 
uh, even well before we were podcasting was we will not have a donate button on our page all year. Uh, it's, it's just you become immune to it. It's not a big deal. You know, you just ignore it. So what we decided to do is that once a year we do what we, we do a donation drive. You so do it as a drive, right? That's, a, that's interesting. As, Probably creates a lot a more excitement. Yeah. It creates a ton of excitement. Uh, what we do is if you donate, you'll actually on the forums under your name, you get a little symbol that indicates you donated. And if you know, and over the, we've done like nine of these now. So we've actually got, we make a new symbol every year. So if you donated nine times, you've got this little doodad under your forum name that nobody else has. So there's some status there. Uh, there's some buy-in uh, when you do things like that. We offer prizes and, and you know, little thank yous and things for donating. And uh, we make it a big community thing. And then because it's like, you know what, we're going to open it up for a month. And after that, we're closing it. We will not take donations again for a year. Uh, and that's been a that's been it's it's an odd thing, but it works very very well. It, it, it is an odd thing because the typical internet marketer or just salesperson in general, that's the takeaway close. You know, limited supply, you got to do it now. Yet you're yeah. asking for donations. <laughs> that's, that's just almost funny, yeah. you know. Yeah, but it, it's just it, it's 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 like anything else, right? When there's a certain momentum when multiple people in the community get behind thing, and it just picks up on its own. You know, we get the most donations at the very start of the drive and at the very end, just by a long shot, right? And that's, it's just, a, it's, it's the human mentality. It's, I mean, I donate to lots of stuff. It's good karma and there's lots of things I want to support. That's, you know, I, I'm usually either the, in the first or the last as well when I'm donating. So it just makes sense that way. So doing it that way, it's helped because it means that all of our expenses are covered for the year in one shot. It covers some travel to some conventions, some hotel, a few other little things, you know, site development, hosting, things like that. So it means that we, we never operate our site at a loss. We haven't since we started. And, uh, and, that's, and that's been huge because, you know, it is a hobby site for us. Although I, I like to think that we have quite a bit of influence and we have quite a bit of uh, quite a following in the industry at this point. Because we're independent, we don't run ads on the web page itself. I think they're pointless. I think they make people angry. I think it harbors, it doesn't give you any goodwill and they just don't pay well enough to be worth all the all the negative energy around it and and i think that you know it's it's been very successful well what are your plans for the future with your show well uh for the show for the future uh we've done uh just actually we were just at a convention a couple weeks ago in boston and we did uh, our first ever panel live in front of an audience and we actually pulled about a thousand people uh, which was pretty exciting. So I think we're going to be doing more of that uh, as best we can. Um, that was really great. Otherwise, uh, I think that there is some potential for doing a bit more video in a more formal video kind of way, uh, although I haven't thought too deeply about that because, again, we're not all in the same room. So it makes it that much harder to pull that off. Beyond that, more interviews, more guests. You know, We do it partially because, honestly, we're so busy. It's the only time we have a chance to talk to each other. So... <laughs> <laughs> you know, so things like that. And beyond that stuff, you know, we're, we're planning uh, some site redesigns where we might be taking uh, a lot of our written content and putting it into book form uh, at some point in the next year or so. We might use Kickstarter to do that. And uh, so we, we've got some plans around that. So, yeah, lots of different monetization plans. That's interesting. Good stuff. Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. Well, what else would you like podcasters to know, you know, in terms of best practices they can do to help their shows be more successful or, you know, any particular maybe niches that you see in the industry where uh, someone might jump in and think, hey, this is the growing area of podcasting. I don't know. There's a few things I could offer. Uh, I think that the days of the generalist podcast are done. Uh, I think that if you're going to do a if you're going to do a podcast, you have to have something specific. You need to fill a niche that's not there or that's at least underserved. Uh, you need to have something unique to say, and, and that, that can be really difficult because if you get too specific, it can be really hard to do a weekly show. Beyond that, if you're going to say, yes, I'm doing a show every week, you're going to do a show every week. And if you're going to say the show's up Wednesday morning like, like mine is, 
the show is up Wednesday morning. You know, we've been doing this for six years. We've never missed a show. Even if at times it's just been me and someone else or it's, you know, I've even done one show where it was just me, just so that we could say that we did a show that week. So it's really, really important to be consistent and uh, with that. And if you don't think you can do weekly, then be consistent bi-weekly. But you've got to be consistent no matter what you're doing. Some, some pet peeves of mine, uh, which thankfully you're not indulging in because this would be really embarrassing uh, for, me, <laughs> for me to say. Oh, I don't do right. things perfectly. You can, you can be yeah. a critic. That's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, it, is that, and this is something I used to do uh, early on, which is when you're interviewing somebody, don't say, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like you're not doing that. Right. That that's a really like it's something that I used to do a lot. And it's very annoying when you're listening back to it, listening to somebody going, uh-huh, 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 because you're not in a real conversation. You know, you can just be silent while the other person speaks. That That's more of just a personal pet peeve of mine. Uh, same with like banging on the desk if your microphone's sitting on the desk. Beyond uh, that, I would say. I think interviews are a go- great way to grow your audience. Like with, with this particular show, once you put it online, I'll be linking to it on my Twitter, if nothing else. And so my followers will check it out. And uh, I'm sure you'll retain a few. Uh, you'll get some new listeners out of that. I think doing interviews is great. I think that you and, and, never- and the, the thing, the reason it's great is because it has the viral component. The interviewee is spreading it to their community and their tribe, as well as you're spreading it to your tribe. So you're really doing each other a favor. It's a great yeah. thing, yeah. And, and no money changes hands. I mean, that's one of the cool things about the podcasting community is that everybody, I've never talked to anybody I felt like was podcast competition because frankly podcasting as a medium is still so small and so new that we're all kind of in this thing together right yeah and that's a great Uh, thing it really is it really is the market is so big yeah it's potentially huge so i think and never be shy about reaching out to people for interviews uh when you're like when we sat down to to start doing the show you know within about six or seven shows we're like okay like what's our dream list of people we'd like to talk to people we'd like to interview and we've hit them all over the years. And a lot of them, it was just straight up sending out an email or, heaven forbid, picking up the phone and actually calling uh, and talking to people. You will be shocked at some of the people you can get just by asking because no one else thought to. So I think it's really important to be to be forthright in that and make sure before you reach out, though, you have a good product. You've got your stuff together. It sounds professional. You've got, you've got it all kind of in place and you feel confident with it because you only get a first impression once. So that that's also really important. Yeah, very good points. Very good points. Now, you talked about being consistent, and I couldn't agree with you more. If you want to be different, be consistent, because that's really different than most people. But one of the things I love about podcasting, and that's one of the things that we've all sort of, in the new world of communications, become accustomed to, is the concept of asynchronous communication, where the podcaster can produce at their convenience, the consumer or the listener can, or the viewer can listen or view or consume at their convenience. And do you think it, it's more important to podcast regularly, because I know that will help you in search results, certainly in iTunes, or it's more important to podcast regularly and on a specific day? Because I don't do the specific day type of podcasting, but I do podcast regularly. And a couple of my listeners have said, one of the things I love about the other shows I listen to is that, you know, I know that every Friday this show goes up. I've never done that. Maybe I'm losing a lot by not doing it, but feel free to be a critic. Don't be agreeable. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I would say that there's there's something very, very powerful in habit, uh, in, in and that's not just in what we listen to and how we consume things. It's 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 in you know drinking and food and and entertainment and what we go to for comfort you know it gives me a lot of comfort to know that some of my favorite podcasts are waiting for me Monday morning before I go to work you know I know I have this thing that I'm going to listen to on my way to work even though it's Monday even though I've got a pile of things to do I've got this to look forward to in my commute right and it's not to say it doesn't degrade the value of what I'm listening to if it's not consistent but it me it it operates kind of in a separate block in my life it's random so it's more like a pleasant surprise which is also nice but if you want to grow an audience and if you not only do you want to grow an audience if you want to get some attachment to what you're doing you want to get into that routine you want to be right there with you know i watch lost on thursday nights and you know like you want to be in that same sort of uh, headspace because that because eventually it's not just 
specifically about what you have to say and the, and the, the chemistry of your co-hosts and all that stuff matters, but it's also just you're part of the routine, right? How, so how many, yeah, yeah shine I agree. Yeah, there. no, definitely people are creatures of habit. There's no question. How many podcasts, for example, do you subscribe to personally as a consumer? Uh, as a consumer, I am subscribed to probably about 30. Now, most of them are not weekly. Uh, and uh, some of them, like This American Life, for example, they'll sometimes do repeats, things like that. Um, so there's about 30. I would say as far as like ones that I count on as part of my routine that I listen to uh, consistently, there's probably about 10 that I'll listen to throughout the week. Because I drive around a fair bit, and so it's, you know, I listen quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's fantastic. See, it, it's funny because my consumer habits are, I just sort of, you know, my phone syncs, it, it grabs the new episodes, and then when I'm walking or driving or whatever, I'll listen to whatever happens to be on there. I never wait for a show to come out. I guess I listen sort of more randomly than that. And I subscribe to about 40 shows or so, but I can't really listen to them all anyway. I subscribe to more than I actually hear. So it's just kind of interesting how that is. But I think iTunes especially really, really likes you when you publish on a specific day. I have I have noticed that about other shows and, and their kind of rankings or iTunes SEO, which, by the way, brings me to another question for you before you go. Do you have any tips on getting more listeners uh, other than publishing regularly, which is a great one, and having great content and so forth? But, you know, I think there's a whole new field that nobody really addresses, and I, I'm going to call it iTunes SEO, getting search results in the iTunes search engine. I think that's sure. critically important to podcasters. Yeah, and, and uh, I guess the, the unfortunate thing is that I've long since given up on trying to figure out how, how iTunes, how their metrics work. I, I really, I just don't know because when I look at my show on iTunes, it'll say, you know, also recommends and we're often – you know, we're all we're often listed with a lot of very popular shows. You know, we're also we're often in that always recommends bracket. Why we are, I have no idea. Like I don't know how iTunes works it. All I know for sure is that I think that the everyday thing or the you know the consistent day thing matters because what it means is that on a certain like like for us like we post our show late Tuesday night, so most people get it Wednesday morning we jump up the charts, right? Because there's a lot of downloads all at once. And beyond that, uh, like I said, we have a lot of, in, uh, of reviews. At least I can, relative to a lot of other shows, our review count is quite high. Uh, between those two things, that seems to really push us up and down the charts quite a bit. Uh, beyond that, though, I'm not too sure. It seems like uh, I think that new listeners, I think new downloads are weighted heavier than consistent ones. I think that uh, iTunes might be looking at IP, like source IP addresses, maybe things like that. It seems like new subscribers specifically tend to be weighted onto a show heavier than subscribers who've been subscribed for months at a time. So I, I wish I had a secret answer to that, but honestly, anybody who says they figured it out, I, I think they're lying. Yeah, well, that's kind of <laughs> like figuring out Google. I don't think anybody figures out Google either. You know, they try, yeah. and yeah. maybe they make a dent in it, but they don't really figure it out. Anybody who tells you, oh, I'll get you on the first page of Google under all these different search terms, uh, it's probably a scam. Probably, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good. Well, anything else you'd like to mention in closing to our listeners? Well, uh, I want to uh, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's been really cool talking about this. I don't get to talk shop a whole lot, so that's always fun. Uh, you can uh, check out a lot of my stuff at gamerswithjobs.com. I'm on Twitter at Certis, C-E-R-T-I-S. Uh, if you have any questions or any other advice you want to ask for, you're certainly welcome to reach out to me there. Um, and uh, I also do, uh, I have a personal site that is vastly different from Gamers with Jobs. It's called strivingpodcast.com. Uh, and that one's, uh, I, I kind of break my own advice there because that one is sporadic. Uh, and it's uh, something I record. It's more about, uh, you know, personal growth, spirituality, things like that. And uh, sometimes it's just me. Sometimes I have a guest and uh, we just talk about kind of life and life lessons and, and things like that. So it's kind of a smaller project I do on the side. People may want to check out. Fantastic. Hey, Sean, two things before you go. What is Certus? What does that mean? Uh, oh, it's uh, the Certus, all that is, well, actually, if you Google it, I think it's a crop. I think it kills bugs in crops. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I picked uh, C-E-R-T-I-S mostly because I needed a handle uh, to log into in, log into games to register for things that no one was using. Uh, so I grabbed a nearby book, I flipped open to a map, and I looked for a really small town, and that's what it was. 
and, and it's like these decisions you make 12 years ago that seem so insignificant that name has followed me through my whole on, online career at this point. So, uh, so that it just kind of stuck. Uh huh. Cool. Cool. Very cool. And and you did not mention anything you want to mention from the video game world. You know, what are the hot games nowadays? Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> Big you question. know, as as far as the the video game world, you know, honestly, I'm just as into board games as I am into video games at this point. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm. I would say that in the video game world, the, the coolest thing that's going on right now is so many games are free. So many games you don't need to pay anything to try out, uh, and you can basically pay as you go whatever you feel like doing. So it used to be that you've got to drop 60 bucks on a game to play it. These days, there's a lot of games you can get without paying a cent to try it out, see if you like it, and, uh, and go from there. So if you're somebody who, say, you used to maybe mess around with games back in the day and you just kind of fell off it or you didn't you didn't get into it anymore you felt like it was too complicated uh there are so many games that are free to play uh there's games like tribes ascend uh there's games uh like league of legends like they're these are games that are considered to be very hardcore that used to be you'd pay a lot of money for now you can just try them out and see if you like them so i'd recommend that and uh if you've never looked at plants versus zombies by PopCap, do yourself a favor and check that out that is a game that my grandma, my mom, everybody loves. You can get on iPhone, iPad, PC, Mac, everywhere. So check out Plants vs. Zombies. It's, you know what my you know what my prediction is for you and your show, Sean, is that you're going to get approached by some of these gaming companies to be their spokesperson, their endorser, <laughs> that kind of thing, and they're going to try and buy your credibility <laughs> that you have with your audience and pay you for that. I I it, have a feeling that's coming your way. You know, many many of honestly, we've actually gotten a lot of offers over the years, both to buy our site to bring it into a corporate umbrella um, to I've been approached by people to be community management and things like that. Frankly, one of the reasons our site and our podcast works is because we're independent. Uh, we're not attached to anybody and we're very, very um, connected with our community. And it's very important to us to preserve the integrity of that. And honestly, uh, they, they could never pay me as much as I make running my own business. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, that's fantastic yeah. to have that freedom. People do advertise things they believe in. So, you know, if you like a product, that's the whole concept of endorsements, right? I love so, it. Yeah, I'm happy yeah. to. Any, any product that I, I can back or I enjoy or I think is worthwhile, always happy to do it. And, uh, and we usually take that money and turn it into helping the site in various ways. So it kind of benefits everybody. It's, it's a really nice way to go. That's good. Well, Sean Andrich, thanks so much for joining us today. Gamerswithjobs.com and the other sites you mentioned as well. Appreciate the insights and appreciate you sharing with us today. Well, thanks for having me. It was fun. Copyright the Hartman Media Company. For publication rights and interviews, please email media at jasonhartman.com. This show offers very general information. Opinions of guests are their own. Nothing contained herein should be considered personalized, personal, financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. Every investor's strategy and goals are unique. You should consult with a licensed real estate broker or agent or other licensed investment, tax, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed. Please call 714-820-4200 and visit www.jasonhartman.com for additional disclaimers, disclosures, and questions.